celestial quality to the pieces. But that is more based around the idea of using really simplistic shapes, very simple forms, the idea of reflection and refraction of light, and also being able to create constellations of light with one or two pieces. Welcome to Inform and uh, Tuesday Night with Lee Broom. It's a really um, exciting evening for us to have someone come all the way from England to uh, make a presentation about life, work, and uh, work, and life. Um, and this is a different kind of presentation because I uh, it's going to be a, a bit of a conversation between us also, which I've never done before. <laughs> so, so um, and I want to thank everyone at Inform for their amazing support and uh, ability to turn this uh, retail space into something really special for presentations. And I think um, I think uh, the Michaels and Todd and Carissa and every just everybody do such an incredible job. So. And um, this is Lee. Hello. <laughs> I don't know how far, how far are we supposed to be from these things? Hello? Yeah, you can hear that. Better? Okay. You can just shout if you can't hear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's our do I start with a question? I guess so. <laughs> okay. Or we could sing. <laughs> oh, Charles suggested <laughs> dancing earlier. Synchronized. Ah. We didn't have time to practice, so sorry. Yeah. We will not inflict that upon you. Um, so, okay, so I'll start with the question and we mm -hmm. can go from there. What qualities did you learn when you were young that you use today? Um, a, a lot. I think a lot of what I do now really step, well, like most people, stems from, you know, when they were a child and their upbringing. Um, my upbringing was fairly unusual in that I was a child actor. Um, I, you know, was enrolled into theatre school at the age of seven and my, I think my parents noticed that I was a fairly flamboyant individual um, so, and they wanted to challenge, channel that into something and they sent me to theatre school and I was in fact a working actor during ten years from the age of seven till I was seventeen. Um, I was a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company. I was in many sort of TV shows and theatrical productions. And this was a career, you know, this wasn't a hobby. And it was a career that I was going to go into as an adult as well. Um, so it was interesting that I changed and moved into design. But I think the kind of, um, kind of qualities that have attributed to sort of who I am today in that period, well, I think, first of all, is the sort of, kind of, you know, if you own your own business, is you have to have a certain sense of tenacity. Um, and certainly when you're going to many auditions, you know, as a child, and you're having so many knockbacks, you're too short, you're too this, you're not good enough, or you're, you know, you're not right, or you don't look right, you know, you kind of build up a thick skin. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence, I think, as a young age, and I guess the ability to go out there and sell oneself and certainly in this industry you know it's one thing being a good designer but it's quite another putting yourself out there putting your work out on the line and having people kind of judge what you do you know that's why we see many sort of starving artists who are just paralyzed by that notion of just not being able to put their work out there um, and I definitely think it gave me the confidence to be able to do that and then I guess the overall theatricality of my upbringing, seeing things as a performance, definitely put itself into the shows that I present, for sure. And, you know, kind of wanting to create an emotional spectacle for people and not just seeing the product. Super important that the product's good, but, you know, to create some sort of emotion around what you're looking at, you know, some sort of sensory experience has been, you know, really stems from that, I think. So the truck in Milan, mm. that was brilliant. 
Yeah, I mean, that was based actually around me wanting to do something very small because we'd done a very big show the year before called The Department Store um, where we recreated a whole Libroom department store and it was a huge collection. Then I wanted to do something, you know, much more kind of boutique but also really wanted to do something that everybody could see because, you know, you've been to Milan, you know how intense it is. There's so many things to see. You can't see everything. I was like, okay, how do I bring the show to the people? And I was literally just looking at our delivery van and I was like, oh, why don't I put the show in that, you know? And then we, we set up this Italian palazzo in the back of the vehicle, um, this faux palazzo, all in grey, and we put my new lighting collection in and we actually drove it from London to Milan with that installation inside. So you can imagine what it was like at customs <laughs> when they <laughs> opened the back. They were a bit perplexed. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just one of those ideas that I kind of thought that somebody would have done already, but nobody yeah. had, you know. So, you know, we've now seen quite a few sort of traveling shows in Milan as a result of that, which is nice. Oh, certainly memorable. Certainly memorable. Well, we gate crashed a lot of parties as well. You know, we kind of like, we'd sort of, some of it was very... Um, planned we had all of our sort of parking spaces and you know all through the municipality of the city organized and then other times we were like why don't we just rock up outside wallpaper magazines party with the van you know so uh it was it was quite it was like guerrilla show if you like it was good awesome 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 okay um Looking at the question, going, okay, non sequitur question. <laughs> <laughs> but to get a bit of texture of, of, of who you are behind all the, all the other stuff, what is your idea of perfect happiness? And Charles, it is you, but we're going to ask for more. <laughs> mm, um, well, that's a difficult question, um, you know, because... I'm a, I'm a very happy person generally um so and I'm I'm happy with my partner and I'm happy with my work and I guess very boringly I'm kind of happy when we're just together sort of doing nothing to a certain degree I think it's those kind of smaller supposedly less interesting things in life that become the most interesting when you when you look back um and I've certainly had amazing things happen in my career which I love, um, but I think the kind of more simpler things I enjoy enjoy the most, you know. They're impossible to script. Mm, yeah, exactly. Like they just, you just are. Yeah, yeah, and they just happen. And I think all of these things are more noticeable retrospectively when you kind of look back and you say, wow, God, that was a really kind of happy moment. It's very difficult, I think, to be kind of super fulfilled right in the moment, right now. You know, that doesn't kind of exist. If you are trying to do that, then it becomes very forced and it becomes very pressured, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think those moments where you kind of look back and you were sort of, you know, not doing much, but yeah, doing everything, I guess. Awesome. Uh, yeah. You live in London? Yes, yeah. But I travel a lot. Um, and, you know, we have our store in New York, so we're back and forth to New York a lot. Um, and obviously, we've been traveling a lot over the past few weeks mm -hmm. um, across Canada and across America and doing these talks and things. So um, I. I like that. When I first started my business, I kind of I traveled less and felt very British and being British brand was very much part of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And now I feel very global, <laughs> which I think is good, you know. It's 11 th years. Yes. Yeah, it is. Wow. Yeah. Um, and definitely the last five years have been uh, a kind of big trajectory, kind of upwards and incredibly busy. Um, but you know, it's, it's what we wanted, you know, it's what we wanted to happen. And I'm very lucky to be able to do what I do, you know, um, to create my own designs and manufacture my own pieces and create my own vision and have my own brand. And a lot of people are not able to do that. And it is tough and it is challenging, um, but the ups are really worth it, 
you know. How do you have time to design? Like, how do you design? Do you design all the time? Are you always drawing and thinking? I'm always thinking. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily always sketching every day. I'm sketching, you know, a couple of days a week. Um, but I'm, I'm always thinking. I have a pretty photographic memory for anything visual. Um, you know, for, for kind of anything that's sort of numbers and words and things like that, I, I can't really... Um, take that in as well but for visual things I can remember a lot so I can see something from like a few years ago and then pair it with something that I've just seen like a side of a building or a kind of bit of architecture or a tapestry or whatever and then put the two things together um, so I'm very visual and when I go to bed and I go to sleep that's you know that's the time when I'm kind of thinking I go to sleep always sort of designing something and I have a sketchbook by the bed as well. I was going to ask you that, yeah, if you had a sketchbook. Well, most of the, the time you'd like, you know, because I dream about things as well. And, you know, um, the crystal bulb that we designed, which you have on the desk yeah. of the reception, I actually um, dreamt that product uh, eight weeks before we launched it in Milan. And I had a different product to release in Milan. And then when I told my partner about it, it was like, you've got to do it for Milan, you've got to do it for Milan. And so we kind of produced it, we found a manufacturer, we produced 30 of them in eight weeks. Um, and that was from a, a dream, you know. And actually, normally, when I pick up the sketchbook, I'm like, the next morning, what the bloody hell is this? You know, it's usually some sort of mess. But um, yeah, you know, I'm kind of, I think you, you tend to be the most creative in two parts, when you're very, very relaxed, or when you're super busy. Those are the two things. It's like, you know, when you want to get something done, give it to somebody who's busy. Yeah, it's that kind of mentality, yeah. I think. Yeah. So is that why your life's so crazy traveling, store in New York, London, traveling the world? So you're either super relaxed, going to Palm Springs in 42 degree yeah. weather, or giving talks and traveling. Yeah, actually, it's, yeah, it is pretty much like that. <clears throat> it's kind of two polar opposites. I actually do find it difficult to relax sometimes. It is quite difficult to unwind when your brain's been so switched on and, and stuff like that. And when you own your business, you don't completely switch on. And I, I, I live with my partner. He's my partner and my business partner. So you go, <laughs> there is no rest. Yeah. <laughs> and that sounds terrible, doesn't it? No, um, there is. But, you know, the thing is, is that we both do very different things in the business. He does the business. I do the creative. Um, so actually, when we're at work in London, I'm at the top of the building and he's in a completely different area. So when we go home in the evening, we've actually got quite a lot to talk about. It's kind of, how was your day, darling? Well, I did this. And because we haven't really seen each other. Um, so, yeah. But it's, it's great when you're actually... A lot of people shudder when they think about the idea of working with their partner. But I think it's, I think it's good. We do very different things. And it sounds corny, but we are designing our lives essentially yeah. together yeah. yeah yeah so that's why we can go to palm springs in the middle of our very busy schedule yeah 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 yeah, yeah there are challenges i don't know niels and i well we carpool every day together we're pretty well every day together <laughs> uh we are partners in the businesses and same thing i mean i guess it's been 24 years now about so we do work five minutes apart. Yeah. It's almost like five stories in a building. It's pretty, yeah. Yeah. But I think you kind of, and, you know, you will know this, it's sort of you build up a routine and a kind of rapport and a way of working, and you know how to switch off from work at some point. Mm. But, you know, your work is your life. And it this is. is your creation, you know. And why would you want to kind of forget that, you know? Yeah, no, no. It is really a business of passion yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. and trust yes yeah She's for huge. sure no no trust absolutely is huge. yeah so who are your heroes in real oh. life um <laughs> well i i would i would say my mother um she you know invested a lot into my upbringing in in the theater um you know it was very much kind of it felt like a career for her as well she was you know, she wasn't a pushy stage mother, but she didn't hold back. She was kind of, you know, definitely um, 
yeah, you know, she, she encouraged it and she loved that whole world, the theatre, and um, she just encouraged me to be who I wanted to be. And then when I ended up moving into design, um, she was very supportive because that was kind of a big shock for her. You know, she'd invested a lot about me becoming a, an adult actor. But um, I was very passionate about design. My dad was an artist and he taught me how to draw. Um, and I got in because I entered a fashion design competition, which was judged by Vivian Westwood, which was the Young Designer of the Year Award in the UK. And I won. And uh, I got to meet Vivian um, at the awards ceremony and very kind of stupidly asked for her autograph and an autograph book. And she wrote her phone number down and she said, if you want to get into fashion, maybe give me a call. You can come to the studio and see how things work and spend a couple of days here. And I did, but I didn't realize that it would be just with her in her office and I was party to all of the meetings she was having and she was talking to me about her passion for the history of art and um, the history of pattern cutting and how she'd take that and create contemporary patterns. And it was just like overwhelming, especially in kind of such formative years. I was 17 at the time. And wow. anyway, I ended up staying there for 10 months and I was an intern and she took me to Paris and. My job in Paris was to dress Kate Moss and Naomi Campbell and, you know, it was like, it was an amazing experience. Um, and I decided after that experience that I wanted to study fashion design and become a fashion designer. And uh, so it was, my mother was sort of disappointed, but at the same time she couldn't be disappointed given, you know, it's Vivian Westwood, you mm -hmm. know, it was like... Um, and I got a place at Central St. Martin, so, you know, she became very supportive of that. Was your mum an actor? No, she wasn't. She became best friends with the woman that owned the theatre school, which is a smart move. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, no, she just loved being part of that world. It's very funny, because when I take my mum to any events, um, and we meet people, like I took her to the Elle Decoration Awards, and you know, when I'm sort of pe meeting people and people are like, oh, congratulations, Lee, it's fantastic. And then she'd be like, he used to be an actor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was her main thing. But it's very sweet. She's very proud. And I'm very proud of her as well. That's awesome. And you spoke about your dad in the past tense. Oh, no, he's still around. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just clarifying. Well, well, he was an artist. He's oh. not an artist anymore, oh, okay. but he is around still. Yeah. Um, he had less involvement in my life. My parents were together, but they divorced as well when I was 13, and I went to live with my mother. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I was a little bit estranged from my father for a while, um, not for any major reasons that dads can be quite useless sometimes, you know? <laughs> um, Take note, gentlemen. <laughs> um, and, in, yeah, and he was sort of building his new life and new kids and stuff like that. So, um, but we're, we're close now and he's proud. I think he's, you know, pleased that... I ended up pursuing something that he very much encouraged. You know, it was his dream when he was younger to go to art school and his parents wouldn't allow him to go. You know, oh, he yeah. had to go to grammar school and um, he ended up setting up a printing company with my mum. They actually worked together as well, which is one of the reasons that put me off initially. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's he was you know, pleased that I ended up going into this industry because in a way I'm doing something that he was never had the opportunity to, to do. Interesting, interesting. Okay, gonna... What talent would you most like to have? Oh, um... <laughs> uh, I, would, I would like to be able to cook. Really? Yeah, yeah, I can't cook at all. No? No. Are you good at cleaning? Yes. Oh, okay. Well. Very good at cleaning. I think um, uh, that almost. <laughs> I like, don't do it that often, but oh, you know, oh, but that's um, not so good then. <laughs> no, um, but no, I, I, I'm a hopeless cook. I can't cook at all. If it wasn't for Charles, I don't think I would eat. Um, so yeah, and I, I really admire people who are good in the kitchen. You know, 
think takes a real confidence and flair and sort of, yeah, I'm just uh, the hopeless. I think the only thing I can pretty much cook is spaghetti bolognese, but that's out of a jar. <laughs> that's <laughs> still cooking, right? <laughs> that's still cooking. That's still cooking. Ha it's curious to me because you're self-confident and you have flair. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I can't be good at everything. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough, I guess. No, no. Um, seriously, I don't know what it is. I don't know enough about ingredients or what goes together. I'm kind of actually not a foodie person. I mean, I like restaurants. I, I enjoy eating and I know what sort of tastes good, but I couldn't tell you what's in stuff. Do you mm. know what I mean? And mm. I think it's a real craft and probably if I was taught the basics I'd probably get a handle on it but yeah I'm not I'm just not so good at cooking I'm good at making cocktails yeah okay pouring so wine. I have my role in the dinner party scenario yeah. sounds good yeah sounds good sounds good I think that's funny that's great what's your greatest extravagance uh clothing yeah. Uh, yeah. Who are your favorite designers? Who do you buy? Like, do you buy everything or are there specific? Like, do you have a lot of Vivian Westwood still? Um, I did do, but it just all went missing. I don't know where it went, which is Ooh. awful because I think my sister stole it. But mm. <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, oh God, I like lots. Um, uh, lots of the big brands like Gucci and Saint Laurent and. Louis Vuitton and Balenciaga and and then I like you know I like Tom Brown as well I love his clothes um, and I like you know vintage stores as well mm. I like fashion I like clothing mm. you know I mean I studied fashion so you know it's a passion of mine and I like really well made uh, clothes and interesting pieces so I always follow the collections and yeah I'm kind of m much more inclined to read a fashion magazine than an interiors magazine hmm. yeah hmm. do you shop at Dover Street in yes London yeah I love Dover yeah. Street I no, love the amazing. experience and yeah. the editing yeah yeah I love the whole I mean that's a I don't know if you call that a department store it is a department store but it's like a super concept high concept one and I love that it was kind of one of the reasons that store and Liberty in London, which I also love, were kind of two of the stores that really made me want to do my department store exhibition and, you know, kind of recreate my own fantasy department store. So where everything was blown out in grey and it was only the products that we were creating that were in the actual colour that they should be. But we had a millinery department and a wine shop and a men's wow. accessories and perfumery and fitting rooms and um, yeah and it was kind of like a, a cinematic experience which I loved but kind of quite unusual yeah so is anything not pop up like that in your future do you think um, in terms of the concept as a pop-up yeah well just the concept like a concept store or are you too busy with everything else Oh, I mean, I would love to. <laughs> You've I, heard I, the sigh, retailers. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. tough. I mean, I would love to. I mean, I think we've kind of, yeah, I would love to have my own department store and create other brands as well and kind of fashion and, you know, that's big, that, you know, I would love to do something like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I would love to have my own hotel as well. That would be oh, an ideal. Oh, yes. Yeah. What are the things that are fabulous in hotels you've been to recently? Like, what are the things that stand out? At, pu at the public, where we stayed in New York, Oh yeah. they had those little personal steamers in the room. Oh, I didn't see iron. that. They have those. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, it was awesome. And never used one of those little steamers before. They work like a hot dang. <laughs> it's fantastic. Because, you know, everyone's carrying carry-on now, and everything looks like spaghetti bolognese when yeah. it pulls out of the suitcase. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, we stay in a lot of hotels, so I'm always kind of, you know, critiquing, you know, the rooms and stuff like that. Um, but there are some brilliant ones. I mean, I still think Soho House do a really great job at hotels because mm -hmm. the rooms are very big and they kind of think of everything and having the two sinks and, you know, a roll top bath and, you know, classical music playing when you walk in. And it's kind of like just those little touches are really important. Um, I think one of the 
The two best hotels I've ever stayed in are um, Etem in Stockholm, which is the translation of Etem is at home. And that was designed by Ilse Crawford. Oh. And that was incredible. She did such an amazing job on that place. And the idea is, is that you go in, nobody else can go into the hotel unless you're staying there. Oh. And I think they only have something like 20 rooms. And they just make you feel at home. And there's no menu. You get down there for breakfast and somebody's cooking. And they're like, hey, what do you fancy? I've got some eggs. I've got some bacon. or I've got some muesli or whatever. Um, and... It can be quite dangerous because they do the same with the wine as well. <laughs> Why don't you try this? I've got this in the fridge. Why don't I pull this out? And you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'll have that. And then, yeah. <laughs> then the bill comes? Yeah. The, well, not uh, even that evening at the end of the stay, the bill comes. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it's a beautiful experience. And Claridge's in London. Um, I went there for my 40th birthday and stayed there. And that was amazing. Yeah. They just have everything right. So where would your hotel be? In your New York. Your imaginary hotel would be in New York. Yeah. Wow. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Why New York? Because I'm sick of so many hotels in New York. <laughs> and they're very expensive in New York. So I know that you can make a lot of money out of hotels in New York. <laughs> Isn't the land really expensive in New York? Yeah. No, of course. Um... But I, I think it could be a good place. If I was doing my own hotel, it would be somewhere outside of my own hometown. Mm -hmm. I think that would be more interesting than doing something Well, that in would London. be logical also, wouldn't it? And, and of course, I'm, I'm not staying in hotels in London very much either. No, so, like, my sure. barometer of the hotels in New York is, is um, you know, quite clear. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Great. Um, where did I... So what drew you... Um, acting, fashion design, what, what was the step to lighting? Um, I, well, I was at Central St. Martins and I, you know, it's expensive being a student in London. And in my final year, I wanted to um, get a job, but I'd had some really crappy jobs and I wanted to sort of just do something for myself that was a bit more flexible. Um, and I was into interiors. I'd sort of designed my apartment and, you know, it was the late 90s, so it was kind of lots of paint effects and it was just a bit crazy, but I was like into interiors. Um, so I decided to go into my local bars and restaurants in Notting Hill, where I was living, and ask if they wanted any decor advice, you know. And, <laughs> you know, <it's laughs> and, and how did Which, you pull that off without making them mad at you? Well, you know, because I, 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 I went in there and sort of was just like, oh, I can, I can make mirror frames, I can do upholstery, you know, those chairs need reupholstering, I can see that, and I've got these really nice fabrics, or I've just sort of got these ideas, have you thought about doing these drapes, and, you know, these are kind of independent bars and restaurants, kind of quite rough and ready, um, so I started doing that, and it was kind of became a bit of a side business. And then one of the bar owners asked me to design a whole venue from scratch. And this oh. is just after I graduated. And so I enlisted the help of my friend Mackie, who I went to university with, and we took on this project called Nylon, which was in the city in London, in the financial district. And it started off as kind of... Um, it was like a £50,000 budget. And, you know, they were like, do, do some of your paint effects and your upholstery and... But it was in the city, so me and Mackie, having no experience of working with budgets, were like, oh, you know, sketching things with Murano glass chandeliers and floor-to-ceiling fish tanks and booth seating, and was just like, what about this? And they were like, oh, we love it. So then they ended up getting investment, and they spent three-quarters of a million pounds on the project. Okay. They enlisted architects to come on board. They had the contractors, we project managed the entire thing, we designed furniture, lighting for it. I mean, it was like, it was a dream project. Um, but it was like an intense training course, you yeah. know, for us in interiors. And there's a lot of things that we hadn't got a clue, but we were just like, we'll find out, it's fine. And then we went away and we found out, we learned a lot from working with the architects and the contractors. 
And then the venue opened and it started to win like Evening Standard Bar of the Year Award and it won other awards and it was crazy busy. It was like a playpen for the financial district because they didn't have anything quite like that. It was all wine bar mm. sort of centric at that point and this was like a, a major play pit and it was, it was wild there. Um, and so I myself and Mackie started to get offered work to, to design other bars and restaurants. Um, and we did that for the next four years. Wow. And, and it was really mainly independent bars and restaurants. We what? had a business called Mackie Lee. Mackie Lee. What year was that that Nylon opened? So we start. that was 2003, okay. yeah, when it opened. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I think the thing is, is that I still, when I started that project, I still thought I was going to be a fashion designer. But the thing was, is that I was so keen on owning my own business. I didn't want to work for anybody else. And at St. Martin's at that point, everybody was going for jobs in Paris for Dior. And um, the only job in London was like Westwood. I'd already been there or McQueen. And so, but I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to have my own business. But doing that in fashion required, you know, a huge um, cash injection, which I didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and here was a business that was incredibly creative. I was doing my own thing. Um, my vision in my head, or our vision in our heads, were being realized, and we were being paid for it. It's a service-led industry. And I thought, well, this is amazing, you know? So when I could take this where I want to, really. So we did that pretty successfully for four years. Sounds pretty successful. Don't you think? Yeah. First project? Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but it was tough because, you know, we were sort of inexperienced to a certain degree, you know, and so our fees weren't very much and, you know, people used to take advantage of us in the beginning a little, you know, but it's just all kind of like a learning curve. What I did do with those projects, I designed as many pieces as I could bespoke. So I started to build up a network of manufacturers in the UK, which is how I then was able to start Lee Broom after Mackie moved back to Japan. Right. So do you think also some of the fashion experience you had of um, fashion shows, and you talked about dressing the mm -hmm. models backstage, yeah. that is really about project management. You know, it's timelines and details, and everything's got to be right, and you can't screw up. Is that also part of... Yeah, no, definitely. That attitude. You knew you had to be that way. I mean, that experience at Westwoods was invaluable, you know, because we would work super late. Um, the show had to happen. It had to be finished. Um, and there was a lot of logistics involved, you know, kind of. You know, I went to Paris in the van with Vivian's son, you know, like delivering the clothes, you know, and it was kind of so I got to learn a lot from that experience. And plus also when we started our business, um, we got a loan from the Prince's Trust, which is a charity that helps uh, young wannabe entrepreneurs from all sorts of backgrounds. And we got to work with like retired accountants who would come in and help us with our books and they got us really cheap rental space to set up an office and you know all things that creatives are incredibly bad at doing initially mm -hmm. um so we had kind of some mentorship at the beginning which was great so this was for Mackie lee yes yeah, yeah interesting yes i mean part of getting that loan was is that you had to present them with a business plan and i was just like why do we need to do that and it's sort of like of course when i did the business plan i was like oh okay right i get this yeah i think um we here in canada could really use something like that we don't have an in a real incubator like that for young designers people are really struggling trying to set up their own businesses or catering to, you know, working bar or crappy jobs, as she yeah. said, to try and keep themselves going. Um, and the mentorship also. Yeah. I don't th is there any organized thing like that here? Anyone know about that? We really should have that, shouldn't we? Wouldn't that be a good thing? When you were starting a business that you actually had experienced people? Well, I mean, when I first started Lee Broom um, and I was doing my own brand. In a way, in this sort of industry, that was quite unusual. Mm -hmm. I think kind of other brands like Tom Dixon had done it, you know, in the UK, but not many others. And everybody was 
very fascinated about kind of designing for the big Italian brands. And it didn't occur to me or interest me to do that at mm. all. And when I first started and I would give lectures at university, you know, the main question would be like, how do I get to design for Moroso? And I'd be like, well, I don't know. And now the question that people ask me is, how do I become a design entrepreneur? How do I start my own business? How do I make my own products? How can I make money out of design, you know? Yeah. And I think that's really interesting, that shift. And certainly social media has really helped and encouraged younger designers to be able to promote their work in ways that you couldn't do, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's true. Um, and it's really exciting to see people want to do that because it's it's a wonderful to design for Moroso, but that funnel is very small, you know, and there's only so many designers that can do that. Um, so I think it's great, but you're right, that there, there should be more facilities set up for designers, particularly to be able to have some sort of mentorship with business people because it, it's very hard. You can't do both. You can have a knack. I always had a really good knack for marketing, you know, but even kind of putting a price on my own work, it's oh. very, very difficult to do yeah. because it comes yeah. very naturally, yeah. you know, even in interiors, you know, for years we were charging hopeless fees because I was like, wasn't charging for the time when I'm sitting at home before going to bed thinking about it. But of course, you know, that's all time that should be charged. You're thinking about it, you know? So um, it's very hard as a creative person, as a designer, an artist, to, to kind of think in that way initially. So along with the mentorship, then you found a business partner that you two were complementary for your business. What, yeah. what, it's very personal. But what came first uh, with Charles? Um, <laughs> Did you meet him as a business person? No, no, no. We, we met in a gay bar. <laughs> <laughs> and it just worked out. It's I was perfect. working on the door. Um, <laughs> you yeah, were working on the yeah. door. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we've been together 16 years. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, and we, he was very much involved in the business from the very beginning, but not full time. So um, I was kind of having to do a lot of the logistics stuff myself and then at the right point we worked together full time and um, Charles is incredibly experienced and very good at business and we've we're very complementary with each other You're yeah. incredibly lucky yes definitely that's and it's what that thing you said about trust I think that's one of the key things of course I trust him impl implicitly you know yeah um so it's, it, it works. But, I mean, you know, working together with one's partner isn't for everybody, of course. So we had to sort of wait and see if that would work. And, and it, it does, definitely, yeah. And so all of this to me, I mean, one of the things that's really coming strongly through, did it, was it your mum and dad and your dad's wish to be having pursued his art? I mean, you're incredibly independent. Like you didn't want to work for, I mean, to me, the idea of being in Vivian Westwood's studio, I would want to, I would never want to leave. I mean, it just sounds so completely amazing. But you always had this idea of this independence. Yeah, I mean, but I wanted to create my own universe, you know? I wanted to create, whether that was in fashion or products or whatever, I wanted to create my own brand, you know? and. I don't know, I mean, I guess that as well comes from my background in theatre and show business, you know, when you're in that world, you're not, you're not doing it because you want to be in the background, you're doing it because you want to be up the front. Um, and that's really just been instilled in my brain from a, from a very young age. It's certainly calmed down since, you know, that eyes and teeth training, but it's... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's still there, of course. So from mm -hmm. a very young age, I don't have any other frame of reference other than like I want to do my own thing. And interestingly, oh. when I worked at Vivian, with Vivian, one of the things she said to me, which I always remember, is do your own thing. Mm -hmm. Don't do what anybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. When I told her that I was going to apply to Central St. Martin, she was appalled. 
because, you know, she was like, why are you going to be homogenized with everybody doing the same thing? Why aren't you doing your own thing? And at that point, I didn't feel like I could achieve what I wanted to do in fashion without going through that process. But then it's very interesting that I ended up doing something that I wasn't formally trained in either. So I ended up taking her advice one way or another, I guess. But Mackie was from school. Yes. So you had a commu- you developed a community of like-minded people. Absolutely. And St. Martin's is incredibly creative. They're not there to teach you how to pattern cut. They're there to teach you how to think like an artist, how to think like a designer, and the process of research, sketching, a sample, a prototype, putting something into production. It's the same whether it's a frock or whether it's a lamp. You know, it's the same process. And when I started Central St. Martin's, I didn't know how to design a garment, much as when I started to do lighting, I didn't know how to design a light. But you find out how to do it. It's all about the mechanics and it's a laborious sequence of problem solving exercises. But the design process is always the same, you know? Solving the problems is the design process, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Abso- absolutely, yeah. yeah. So is that a good segue into just introducing a little bit of Constellation for yes. us this evening? Yes, yeah. Um, so my new collection, Observatory, which is a collection... Oh, observatory, of, yes. Yeah, or Observatory. Oh, okay. Um, a new collection of lights... Uh, which we launched in Milan in April. And then we also did a show in New York for New York Design Week at our store. And really it's a kind of, um, it's a slightly celestial collection. It's loosely based around the solar system and the fact that it has very simplistic forms and shapes and it's about reflection and refraction of light and creating auras and diffusion and lenses and also this idea of being able to create constellations of light as well so particularly with the piece at the far end orion which you can it's only two lights actually one with an illuminated tube and then one with an illuminated globe but you can hang vertically horizontally forward back so something i was really interested in this collection was you know how the end user would use the piece you know which i'd never considered actually before in a collection to you know it was kind of more I'm more in my own moment and designing my own thing and I design from a very emotional place in fact so I'm not thinking about that but with this I was thinking about that a bit more which is interesting but it's very three-dimensional yes like you really can grow it yeah which is different than a lot of your other work Absolutely. Standalone pieces. Yeah, no, for sure. And I like that idea of, um, you know, people taking it and doing their own thing, you know, and kind of how people are going to use it in their homes and how they would use it in their next home or, you know, mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. that's important to me as well, kind of, you know, these are pieces that I want people to have for the rest of their lives and to pass down to their next generation, you know, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. So where do you, because LEDs are so complicated with, you're developing your own bulbs. Mm -hmm. You talked about the one that's coming out in the beginning of the Mm -hmm. year. But where are they even being made? I mean, this is such new technology. I mean, the LEDs are made in China. Yeah, I mean, it's the only place that you really want to get LEDs done. And the technology there is incredible. And we've been working with some amazing factories. And to kind of go there and kind of, you know, kind of look at all the different possibilities that they might not have considered, and especially in using LED in more decorative ways, um, is really interesting. So you actually go to the manufacturing and work with the mm-hmm. R and D. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. And um, wow. yeah, and it's with it, your sketch, or is it the other way around, or both? Both. Both. I mean, sometimes, you know, I would go there with a sketch and say, this is the kind of thing I want to do. And then you get into a conversation and you see what they can do and what's possible. And then you're like, go away. And then you do something based around that. That's the great thing about factory visits is, is that mm-hmm. it's an inspiring environment in itself. Um, and, you know, LED technology, 
Well, okay, it didn't move very quickly initially, mm -hmm. and I think designers struggled, and they still struggle a little bit, and I have certainly with kind of trying to get the right temperatures and trying to get the right luminosity and you know all of that sort of stuff. And but the technology is moving really quickly now, so I'm actually really interested in kind of developing that more, mm. but you know, putting it into really beautiful products. I think we're now only just starting to see LED technology used in really beautiful pieces. As opposed to retrofit, which is, was yeah. the beginning thing was retrofitting it yes. into existing. Yeah, or it just being used kind of more architecturally, right. you know, right. which we're all very used to seeing. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of nice that there are a lot of possibilities, I think. So how often do you go to China? I don't go very much, but my team go quite, I mean, at least five times a year. I'll go once, yeah. Okay. How big's your team? I didn't even ask you that. I thought it, but didn't uh, I? There's 25. 25 yes. people, all yeah. in London? No, no, we've got three in New York, um, and then the rest are in London. But we have a thing called our, it's our factory, which is in East London, not far from our head office, and it's like our... We have our workshop there and our electrical workshop and our distribution center and logistics team. So there's like another seven people there wow. that are all doing the quality control and the assembly and everything else. And then I've got design studio in Shoreditch and we've got the showroom there as well. And then the showroom in New York. So, wow. yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Wow. We could do with more. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. going to take over the world, folks, I have a feeling. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that when you're, um, it sounds a lot because people think, wow, you've got 25 designers. And I'm like, no, I've got one designer and I've got four people in my product development team. And the rest of the, you know, the, uh, the company is made up of sales team, PR, marketing, logistics, finance, you know. To, to keep the machine oiled when you're making your own products yeah there's a lot of other things that you have to that you have to factor in did you struggle with packaging and getting packaging do, do you design your own packaging yeah and we design all of our own branding as well um wow. yeah which is uh, you know it's important i think to me that we do that in-house mm -hmm. um yeah, I mean, no, I don't think we have struggled with it so much. Do you have any feedback then? <laughs> no, no, it's great. No, just, I just, um, uh, in Ingo Maurer's book, there's a whole uh -huh. chapter on um, packaging the, the Mamanucci's, mm -hmm. the company they hired to do it so that they could actually package those incredibly fragile pieces. Mm. Or it's, just, it's just one of those things that's so... Mm, attitudinally important as well as practically important? Yeah, definitely. And I think that, again, my fashion background stems into that because I think kind of the receiving of the package is very important and how you feel when you open the box and that mm -hmm. moment when you see the piece. And mm -hmm. we've just started introducing with all of the new products now these cloth bags that come with it and it has Libroom printed on the bags. And they're great because you can, you, know, you can keep them, but you can also use them when you're installing the lights to not collect any dust and so they have a practical element. And yeah, it should be, a, uh, you know, if you're buying a luxury product, you should have a luxury experience when you open the box, much like buying a pair of Christian Louboutin shoes. You know, you, you want to have that experience when you flip open the lid. Um, and you, yeah, you, so it, it, is, it is challenging, certainly with um, fragile pieces, but we look after all of the delivering and everything ourselves as well. So if you outsource all of that, it, that's when you get problems. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Interesting, interesting vertical integration there. Mm -hmm. Really lovely. Great. So, thank you. Do we thank have any you. questions? We could keep going, but I think it's about time to let you guys say something. There's, yes. There's a mic coming, if you want, so everyone can hear. I just wanted to see if you could talk about your experience working with Wedgwood a collection. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> um, so we do... Uh, probably like at least one collaboration a year as well as doing things for my own brand and I enjoy doing these collaborative things because it 
as a designer when I'm working for myself you're just kind of like a blank canvas and I come up with the briefs myself but working with somebody like Wedgwood it's very clear they have their own brand they have such a huge amount of history and an incredible archive as well so when they asked me to to work on the collection I said yes straight away and I got to visit the factory and see how the pieces are made and um, you know initially I was working with Jasperware so that's the original kind of um, uh, 1700s, rented in the 1700s and uh, incredibly meticulous to make. And it's still made on the machines that Josiah Wedgwood invented. There's just two. There's one in the museum and it's an engine turning machine and then there's one on the factory floor. It's from the 1750s. So all the wow. stripes that we produced on the collection is the ripping back of the clay using this wheel. Um, it has to do 60 turns for each stripe. Um, and so all of that and their archives was just so inspiring. And I looked to their, some of the original patterns of the original famous vases, like the panther vase, and took elements of those and combined them with contemporary details. And really took original, like the stripes is, is an original Jasper uh, feature but I stripped away all the decorative ornamentation. Um, so it made them look incredibly contemporary. And the factory workers, who were craftsmen, craftswomen, um, really enjoyed doing the collection because all of those decorative details hide the joins. So they had to work fastidiously to be able to get everything to match up. And it really pushed the factory. Um, but they were so on board with it and they are so proud of the pieces. Um, so it was a really amazing experience to work with them. Awesome. Don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Jen's got the mic. So you've done acting, you've done fashion, you've done lighting. Do you see yourself moving, I mean, with, you've done the collaborations, but do you see yourself moving into other, maybe interior design spaces in the future? Or do you think that this is sort of something that you're going to take with you and keep, that is Lee Bloom? Um, I, I mean, we've done a lot, we've done interiors and we still occasionally do the odd interiors. We have a, a few private clients that I will design, that we don't publicize, that I design the interior for their homes for. And actually we create completely bespoke furniture and lighting items for those projects, uh -huh. sometimes up to 50 pieces. Um, and uh, so that I kind of, yeah, we still do interiors. And, I don't know. I think there are a lot of things that I would like to design that I'm, you know, would like to get my teeth stuck into um, for sure. I don't see myself just sticking to furniture and lighting, like moving forward in the future. Um, you know, kind of even more sort of technology items, but you know, with my own spin on them. I think um, definitely some more collaborations. Uh, we talked about owning a hotel. I'd quite like to just design a hotel for now. Um, I think that would be interesting because I think that that would encompass a lot of things from my background mm -hmm. as well. Um, so yeah, there, there's many things that I would like to, to, to do. I, I don't see myself or the business just sticking to this exclusively over the next 10 years. I would actually like to design um, I mean, I keep saying this everywhere I go, and it's not happened yet. Um, <laughs> I would like to design a pop concert. That's what I would really love to do. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Or a music concert. It doesn't necessarily need to be pop, but like an actual theatrical experience. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. Somebody um, fabulous, like... <laughs> Beyonce or <laughs> Lady Gaga or Madonna, I guess. Yeah, you know. <laughs> now David's gone. Who? Now David Bowie's gone. Uh, yes, no, it would have been amazing to do something for him. Um, yeah, or Prince. I would have loved to do something yeah. for Prince. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, you know, because I listen to music a lot when I'm designing and... Uh, 
So my mind veers off into kind of like designing the tour for the album that I'm listening to, you know, <laughs> if I've listened to it enough. So I'm sure I could do it, yeah. Of course, I, when you said that, I started thinking Cirque du Soleil and you would be amazing. Because <laughs> yeah. that circus is so incredible. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I've sort of flirted with it a bit. I, I did a little bit of stuff for the um, singer Mika, uh, for one of his tours, like did like lighting things for for that. So, but um, yeah, I could see kind of doing more. I think it would be really interesting. Yeah, awesome, great. Um, you might have alluded to this earlier, but um, in the early days when you were doing interiors and um, kind of just starting your career in the creative industry you ended up choosing lighting over furniture or some other, you know, object of the built environment. And I can kind of put the pieces together that maybe it's partly because it's theatrical and you create, um, you know, experiences through shade and shadow and there's a lot more drama than, say, maybe doing, like, a table or a chair or something. Um, mm. Can you maybe go into a little bit more why you chose lighting specifically as opposed to, like, upholstered pieces or, you know, furniture? I think lighting is always really challenging when you don't know how to do it initially and in an, in a way kind of designing a coffee table although isn't necessarily isn't but seems like a an easier starting point when you're having to work with something three dimensional that then has to illuminate that passes all sorts of different restrictions in different countries and um once I'd gotten past that and I knew how to do it, I started wanting to incorporate light into everything. So I was kind of looking at designing more sculptural pieces or furniture pieces, and then all of a sudden I would turn it into a light and kind of give it more of a function, if you like. Um, I think that lighting is a really important part of everybody's life, you know, in a more philosophical way and then in a very practical way as well. You know, when you think about your home, there are sort of three purchases that you make that are fundamentally important. One is the light, one is the sofa, and another one is a bed. And a bed can, has to be incredibly comfortable. That's its main thing. A sofa also has to be comfortable and affordable to a certain way. A light needs to illuminate the space, but it's the one point where you could be a little bit more creative than you could be in other areas and create real conversation pieces as well. So definitely there is a bit more theatricality with that. You know, you're creating focal points and conversation pieces and sculptures that illuminate um, a space. So I, I guess that's why I go back to it. Um, I consider myself a furniture and lighting designer, not just a lighting designer. Um, I've just done more lights, but I, I very much enjoy designing furniture and, um, you know, like last year we did our uh, marble grandfather clock, which was mm -hmm. an incredible piece to design because it is absolutely not a necessity. Um, and uh, it's an art piece and I'd always wanted to design a grandfather clock from my grandparents having one when I was a child and kind of looking up at it and it being mm -hmm. so imposing. Um, so, uh, it's, it's great that I have the opportunity to be able to kind of occasionally go off piste and say, right, I'm going to design this. But it feels like, you know, it comes back to lighting again and again for me. Hmm. Super. Well, thank you. Any, any other questions? I think we're right on. Right on. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much you. for coming. Thank you. And thank you all very much for joining us this evening.